What I'd like to tell you about is something about how we're getting computers to understand material and human languages. So now we're developing really exciting new methods in which we can get computers to understand a lot of human language texts. And a large part of that problem is getting computers to know enough about knowledge of the world. But what I'd like to argue in particular is that these two problems are related, and that's because our texts are knowledge. So for Feifei's stage of things, if developing eyes was what let lizards rule it all over the trilobites, if we look at the kind of society that we've created around ourselves now with our modern technological existence, what's enabled that to happen is that humans have developed a way to store knowledge so that there could be a cumulative improvement of knowledge and therefore we can build ever cleverer things that go on. Okay, so we've now reached this point where our computers or our cell phones can talk to us in human languages. But the problem is, how are we going to get them to understand what we say back? Why are our cell phones and our computers still so dumb? I mean, how are we going to get to the stage where we can get a computer to answer our routine email for us or get a computer to book our next trip to Fiji? That's the promise that people have been advertising. So for example, when Apple introduced Siri, it says, Apple's ads say, it knows what you mean. Siri not only understands what you say, it's smart enough to know what you mean. But for almost anyone who has either used Siri or one of the alternative products, Google Now, Cortana, you've probably discovered that Siri usually doesn't understand all that well what you mean. Um, so um, here's Stephen Colbert having a go of seeing whether Siri understands what he means. And he's saying, for the love of God, the cameras are on, give me something. And Siri's response is, what kind of place are you looking for? <laughs> Churches or camera stores? Well, what's going on here? What we have going on here is, well, the word God appeared, and so Siri suggests churches, and the word cameras appeared, so Siri suggests camera stores. And if you look in deployed natural language processing systems, that's something that happens a lot, that you just get this kind of keyword matching. So here's a kind of cute example. Um, the Huffington Post recently pointed out that whenever Anne Hathaway is in the news, the stock price for Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway goes up. <laughs> really? When Bride Wars opened, the stock rose 2.61%. Looks a lot like keyword matching again. In, we've got a name for this. We refer to this as the bag of words model. Um, at Carnegie Mellon University, they've got a lovely art installation, which is the bag of words model. But there's a lot of natural language understanding that you just can't do with a bag of words model. model. So we have a sentence like, white blood cells destroying an infection, that's good. And we have an infection destroying white blood cells, that's bad. But these two strings have exactly the same words on them. We, we just can't match only on keywords. So where are we going to go from here? We need two things. We need an ability to understand text, and we need knowledge about the world to inform our understanding of text. And the hope is that we can link those two things together because there's knowledge in the text. So how can we go about getting this knowledge out of the text? Well, the first way that people tried doing language understanding on computers is essentially thinking of there are rules of grammar and there are dictionaries and we can write down grammar rules and we can write down what words mean and we'll sort it all out that way. And that just didn't work. The problem is that human language is way too ambiguous. How meanings are interpreted is way too contextually determined. And that just did not give us enough flexibility and robustness to give us human style natural language understanding. So what instead has recently been found to be much more successful is to concentrate much more on learning. So if we start with large amounts of human language material, text or speech, and then try and look at the patterns that occur in that material, then we can start to induce understandings of human language. So one of the common tools we use is actually to place the meanings of words into vector spaces. So the meaning of any word is a big column of numbers. 
And precisely what we're trying to do then is looking at the context in which a word appears and then shifting words around in a vector space so that words appear in similar contexts end up close to each other. And so if we do that, we end up with nice similarity spaces of words where words cluster to be similar in meaning. Um, but that's not the only thing we've been able to build. Something that's been very successfully developed in recent years is natural language parsers. Programs that can look at large amounts of text and start to learn what are the structural units of text that go together to be subjects and objects of phrases. So here's a kind of a hairy long sentence. It's the first sentence of Dickens. Um, but um, these days we can take something like this and feed it into a natural language parser. So this is the standard parser that my group's involved in be building. And it can just parse this sentence and work out the structure of the sentence. Indeed, apparently you can do lots of useful things with the standard parser. You can also use it to help your kids with their homework, I'm told. Um, so that's great. Um, but what I'd like to now go into is in a little bit more detail to look at an example of natural language understanding that moves beyond this bag of words level. And so I'm going to focus in on a little on this task of sentiment analysis, working out whether what someone is saying about a text is positive or negative or neutral. So this task of sentiment analysis is often viewed as a quite easy task. Um, and indeed, it is the case that if you have long documents, it often is easy. You can get 90% accuracies. And well, that sort of makes sense. If you have a very long review, you can just sort of look for some keywords in it and it said loved, great, impressed, marvelous. It must be positive. But if you then look at shorter pieces of text, what you find is you actually need a lot more cleverness to do the interpretation. So here are the kind of reviews you get at Rotten Tomatoes. With this cast and this subject matter, the movie should have been funnier and more entertaining. Well, if we simply look at the sentiment bearing words, it's entertaining and there's funnier, and they both sound pretty positive, um, but this is clearly a negative review. And indeed, if you look at these kind of reviews up until um, the work we did recently, that the best systems were getting more than one in five of these wrong because they weren't doing enough to actually understand the language that's being used. Okay, so what did we do to get further progress on this system? The first thing we did was actually to build richer data because previous data for sentiment had only had global opinions of Rotten Tomatoes style, whether you've got a red or a green tomato. And so what we wanted to do is know more about how meaning is composed in sentences. And so we did this with Mechanical Turk by collecting judgments of the positiveness or negativeness of phrases as they combined into larger sentences. And so you have here life affirming's positive, but when something is not life, life affirming, that's negative. It's vulgar and mean. This is all very negative. But then the sentence ends up, um, but I liked it. And the end result is that this counts as a positive judgment on the movie. So we see the but I liked it right at the end is overriding what preceded it. And so this is the kind of semantic composition we want to learn about. And so we proceed in this way to build a big data set of sentiment labeled sentences. Now, having that richer data just helps all models. So even with sort of simple bag of words models done previously, it helps them having this kind of richer training data. But it's also the case that those models still got a lot of the cases where you need to do a little bit of meaning understanding wrong. So we also wanted to build a more powerful model. And so the kind of model that we've been investigating is applying deep learning techniques to doing natural language understanding, where the starting point of that for representations of words is the same kind of vector space representations I mentioned previously. But then when we start to compute meanings of larger phrases, we do that by composing together these vectors with various matrix operations and nonlinearities to build larger representations of the meanings of a whole phrase that still lives in the vector space. And so doing that, that then gave us considerably more value of pushing up the performance of our systems. 
And in particular, I'd just like to focus in on how this does this a bit more detail for cases that are hard with negation. So if you just negate sentences, put a negation in a word in a sentence, by and large, that makes the sentiment more negative, that using nots is negative. And to some extent, all models get that. The really interesting case is what happens when you put a negative like not into a sentence that's already negative. So if I say something like not bad, well, bad by itself is very negative. Not by itself is somewhat negative. But when you put them together, what do you get? Well, if you learnt logic in high school or university, you should, you'd learn that the two negatives would cancel each other out and it'd mean good. But real life isn't like that. In real life, when you say something is not bad, it's sort of middling, maybe trending slightly positive, but not very. <laughs> and so that's what we see in sentences, right? So if you say it's definitely not dull, um, that means it's maybe a little bit good, but it doesn't mean it's a great movie. <laughs> um, and so that the, the way this works out reminds me of a quote of Herb Clark, who's a professor here in the psychology department. Um, and he notes, the common misconception is that language use has primarily to do with words and what they mean. It doesn't. It has primarily to do with people and what they mean. <laughs> Okay, so what happens when we um, look at negating negatives? What we find is that all of the earlier models just aren't able to handle how the sentiment changes um, when you negate negatives. But our new deep learning model is able to realize that that makes the sentiment much more positive while not extremely positive. And so that we're able to get very good results on these negated negatives when many other models don't. Okay, I want to switch gears for the rest of the time and now say a little bit about knowledge and how we can hope to bring knowledge to bear. Um, so um, this is Jeremy Zawadny. Who's Jeremy Zawadny? He's a guy I've never met. Um, he used to work for Yahoo. He now works for Craigslist. Um, he has a blog, and he had this blog piece about knowledge that I really rather like the sentiment of. So I just want to read you a little bit of that. Um, so he writes... Um, back in the late 90s, when I was building things that passed for knowledge ma management tools at Marathon Oil, there was all this talk about knowledge workers. These were people who'd have vast quantities of knowledge at their fingertips. All they needed was ways to organize, classify, search, and collaborate. I think we've made it. But the information isn't organized like I had envisioned a few years ago. It's just this big, ugly mess known as the web. <laughs> Lots of pockets of information from mailing lists, weblogs, communities, and company websites are loosely tied together by hyperlinks. There's no grand schema, no centralized database. There's little structure or quality control, no global vocabulary. But even with all of that going against it, it's all indexed and easily searchable, thanks largely to Google and the companies that preceded it, AltaVista, Yahoo, etc. Most of the time, it actually works. Amazing. So what then should be our goal for computers? Most people have thought that that's true for humans, but that isn't the case for computers. That humans can just read web pages and understand what's going on and learn stuff, but somehow our computers aren't capable of doing that. And instead, what our goal should be is somehow to extract the knowledge out of the web pages and turn it into some kind of knowledge base that our computers can operate over for reasoning. Um, that's been the dominant position, but not everyone has believed that. Someone prominently who didn't believe that was this guy. Um, so this guy is Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Sorry. Um, and what he wanted to argue is that it's a mistake to try and think that there's some concept of knowledge that's different from and better than the words we have of human languages while solving the same communicative function. So he writes, when I talk about language, words, sentences, etc., I must speak the language of every day. Is this language somehow too coarse and material for what we want to say? Then how is another one to be constructed? 
and how strange that we should be able to do anything at all with the one that we have. <laughs> It'd be so nice to be a philosopher. You could write such more interesting articles than I get to in the engineering publications I have to write. <laughs> and so part of what's interesting is that if we want to understand knowledge, we'll need to understand not only meaning semantics, but also pragmatics. How do you take account of context for meaning? And that's something that our search engines just naturally do extremely well, that they're great at pragmatics, understanding the associations of things. So if I stick into Google the national, Google just knows that the most prominent sense of the national is a band. It's a really good band that I'll recommend to you. Um, <laughs> but if I then put in the national Ohio, Google just knows that one of the national's better known songs is Blood, Blood Buzz Ohio, and it takes me straight to the YouTube page of the video of that. But on the other hand, if I stick in the national broadband, then Google immediately just knows that that's nothing to do with the national um, the group and it takes me to the National Broadband Initiative. So there's all of this pragmatic knowledge of associations and likelihoods of contexts in the world in which things that are used that are just built into how things work. And that's the beauty of working at the level of natural language reasoning. So what we've been interested in in my group is can we do various kinds of inference and reasoning directly at the level of natural language text? So if we have some fact that we're interested in, who is Beyonce Knowles' husband, we transform it into a kind of a statement version with a variable. And our hope is that we can directly answer that question by using as our knowledge base just pieces of text that are available. And so what we've been working on is systems of weak logic that are referred to as natural logics, where you can work out inferences directly on pieces of text. And so we can then sort of build these into systems and say, can we conclude one piece of text from another piece of text? And so we're sort of working out properties of language, um, knowing about verbs and their complements, and properties about the world, knowing where actions are taking place, so we can do inference of these sorts. And so what I've hoped to have shown you a little of is that computer human language understanding is making real progress one of the challenges of making further progress is having computers that have much more knowledge of the world and knowledge of their situations. We've still got a fair way to go. We're not yet at the stage in which we have a computer which has the same ability to interact communicatively as even something like the Wally robot. But <laughs> Our best hope of doing that is exploiting this synergy between the language and the knowledge that go together because texts are knowledge. <laughs>